guys hear me? Oh, we're back. Yes. Yeah, okay. I um, muted everybody, but I forgot I muted Jesse. So. I just wanted to welcome some guests here. Um, um, I brought uh, Terry O'Neill, my wife, uh, 38 years. Is that right, then? Is that right? Tyree. What's 30, that? 38 years, is that right? No, it's wrong. Oh. So. <laughs> Uh, very, very, very uh, yeah, we got married very young. It was very young. Terry was 12. Well, but anyway, let's welcome Terry. Hi, Terry. Hi. Oh, there she is. Okay. Uh, and then we have an old, I shouldn't say old, I, a former Rotarian who lives in El Dorado, John Giso. Giso, there you are. Okay. Hi. And let's see. Oh, look, we have um, Miles Yamamoto, a current member that hardly shows up. Oh <laughs> hey, Miles. Hi, hey, Miles. So, I'm um, trying to get my Zoom squared away. I know, I know, it's tough. Okay, so I'm going to start with the. Um, introduce our speaker and so if you guys could mute except for our speaker that would be great because somebody's got a tv on in the background somewhere. okay how come i'm not showing up here all right um so our speaker today is rod Deardon. now he sent me a short no resume or a bio that was like five or six paragraphs. So I cut it down to one. And I would uh, like to have quiet in the gallery here. Okay, Rod Deeron is a senior emeritus executive director. He's retired from the Mayetta Transportation Institute. And he's also the chair for our district's uh, Beyond Rotary Climate Action Council. And Rod, if you could speak a little bit about that, that'd be great. Um, from 1993 to 94, Rod Deardon Sr. was executive director of the other Transportation Institute. And that's a transportation policy research center created in 1991 by Congress. Rod is known as the father of modern transit service in Silicon Valley and has shared more than 100 international, national, state, and local programs, most related to transit and the environment. His political career began in 1971 as the youngest person ever elected to serve for the city council. He retired in 1995 because of term limits after completing five terms, six times chairing both the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisor and Transit Board. So let's give a warm welcome to our speaker today, Rod Deardot. Now we'll see if this machine works. You hear me okay? I can hear you. All um, right, Brian. Your, your, uh, your success. You and that little Constantino lady. <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's see what we can do here. Uh, can we bring up the, uh, the PowerPoint? Yeah. Just give me a few okay, well, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll uh, give a little introduction. Uh, I, I've served for 50 years in various uh, governmental positions and, and public service positions. And, and during the last 20 of those, I began to realize that uh, all, that, all my work in transportation was really moving towards recognizing that uh, the real challenge of the future was going to be uh, climate change. And so I began working uh, internationally, nationally, and, and locally. And, and locally, I was working through the Rotary Club uh, on uh, developing a program that we could come back, where we could come back uh, uh, climate change at the grassroots level, individually through Rotary. And I, uh, the model I was thinking of was, was Polio Plus, where, where we began fighting polio at the local level right on up. <clears throat> Except that 
the climate issue is much more serious than polio in that it means the end of the world if we don't do it properly. Uh, not the end of the world, the world will continue, but we won't. Uh, so uh, we began working uh, back in the early 2010s, uh, internationally down to locally on setting up the programs and, and launched the first Rotary Climate Action Committee in the San Jose Rotary Club back in 2017. Uh, that's after a lot of spade work in, in around the, the Western United States. At the same time, the International Rotary Organization, RI, uh, created the Rotary, uh, the Environmental Sustainability Rotary Action Group. That's ESRAG, that's the, an acronym, uh, ESRAG. Uh, and uh, so we're now working within ESRAG to promote the combat of climate change uh, from the grassroots level right on up through the international level. And ESRAG is um, the spear point for the Rotary International effort at the international level. We're in the Western region or what's called the Big West region, which from the Mississippi River out to Guam, and it includes about 40 uh, different rotary, uh, uh, rotary districts. And of course, we're district 5173, 470, and our district is the largest contributor in terms of number of, of members and number of local members uh, to the ESRAG Rotary International climate change battle. And so very, we're very proud of that and uh, are asked to speak all over that district, uh, encouraging local clubs to create uh, Rotary Climate Action Committees and launching their climate action efforts within their local communities. And with that background, let me walk you through the uh, PowerPoint and I'll, I'll zoom through the first portion, pardon that pun, uh, the first portion rather quickly in order to dwell on the latter portions a bit more. Uh, and uh, although this first portion is pretty dire, I realize that we do have hope and we, do, we, can, we can fix this for our grandchildren if we all come together and do it right now. Uh, I'll... I'll, I'll give you a little hint. Uh, my wife and I have decided to do it ourselves. We have 34 solar panels on our roof, two Tesla cars, the little inexpensive, that's a little bit of an oxymoron, inexpensive Teslas, and uh, we're net positive to the grid uh, uh, in, under no usual circumstances. So let's, let's begin now and think about doing those kinds of things, which actually saves your money over the long term. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, what we have, what we were told. Uh, we were told originally about climate change back in 1988. We, Time Magazine uh, uh, carried Secretary General's quote uh, in 2018 from his Nobel Prize winning Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, when he said that we may have only 10 years, 12 years at that point left uh, before the impacts of climate would become indelible and uh, we would be stuck with the worst impacts, which would be the end of mammals on earth uh, forever. That, he said that, that was 12 years uh, at that time. We burned up a couple of those years already. Uh, Stanford University's med school biology department chair, Dr. Kate Shapiro said in a rotary speech at San Jose a short time ago, that the world is, has begun the sixth mass extinction. Now this is a person who has won a Nobel prize, uh, a person who is recognized internationally. And she's telling us that we're in the sixth mass extinction now. The, that we have to have radical changes immediately to avoid the most serious impacts. Now, that, those are quotes from Dr. Shapiro. And finally, the New York Times uh, uh, article came out uh, at the end of last year uh, saying we, we've known about climate change for three decades. Uh, what have we done about it? And, uh, and finally, uh, you know, they, they've identified Exxon Mobil and the others as running a highly 
paid for disinformation campaign for the last 30 years. Finally, those oil companies are recognizing that they've got to get on board too. And they're beginning to shift over to uh, not as fast as they need to, but they're beginning to shift over to uh, air uh, uh, windmill, uh, electrical windmill, uh, uh, energy generating farms and solar, uh, solar units and so on. So uh, I guess now we're, the, the quote that we need to be concerned about is, uh, are we going to be able to save a future for our children? And that's the one we, we begin this presentation with. Are we going to be able, we Rotarians, going to be able to save a future for our children? Next, please. The first, uh, the first uh, recorded uh, extinction was 444 million years ago. The last one, the most recent, was 66 million years ago when the, uh, we lost all the dinosaurs. Now, now, Dr. Shapiro says we're into the sixth extinction now. Now, we can still turn it around. We can still, uh, we can still create a future for our children, but we have to do it immediately. And that's, I think, why President Biden and, and uh, John Kerry and others are going around the world and conducting uh, uh, gatherings, encouraging the rest of the world to work very hard to reverse the uh, reliance on carbon-based fuel immediately. And we'll have more to say about that. Next, please. Um, science tells us, and by the way, everything that you're gonna to receive today has been double peer reviewed. And the references are, are shown. So please check it if you would like to, but I can tell you that it's accurate. Uh, it's climate change is happening. It's, it's being caused by human beings. The impacts, some of the impacts are already irreversible. And uh, we have to take radical action today to limit further warming. That's the message to go into this presentation with. Next. These, this is the resource information that you can look at. Uh, uh, it's been approved and, and concurred, concurred in by almost 100% of the scientists, all but the petroleum industry scientists agree with this. Um, 11,000 of those scientists, every, every living hope, uh, Nobel laureate have uh, signed a manifesto demanding that the countries of the world declare a, a climate state of emergency and begin acting on an emergency basis. Next, please. <coughs> what climate change is, just so we all are on the same page, is when the heat from the sun comes to the earth, it bounces off the earth, and in past history, it's gone back out into, most of it has gone back out into the universe. Well, a, a thickening blanket of CO2 and other, and other uh, 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 gases, uh, is occurring around the earth as we burn more carbon. And so that heat is instead of bouncing back into the universe, it's bouncing off the inside of that heat, that gas bank blanket and bouncing back down to earth, which and that recycling of the heat is cooking the planet. Uh, that's, there's no other way of, of putting it. Over a period of time, it's cooking the planet. Next, please. That's a quote that you can use if you use this presentation, and I hope you will. Uh, next, please. This is uh, from the front page of the New York Times, the most uh, respected media in the world by, by actually measure, actual measurement. It shows the last 800,000 years of CO2 in the atmosphere as determined by ice corings studied by Russia, China, the European community, and the United States. Those countries can't believe it, agree on the time of day even, but they agree on this data. And it shows that where the little red arrow is, we are double the highest point in the history of the recorded history of the planet uh, for CO2 in the atmosphere. And we're four times the average CO2 in the atmosphere in the last 800,000 years. You can see that peaks and hollows in the past, those are ice ages and warming periods and we're way above anything else now by actual scientific measurement 
of the ice corings in the Antarctic, agreed to by the four uh, countries normally opposed to each other uh, by actual research. Next, please. So we have CO2 in the atmosphere, that's causing warming. We see this uh, research done by the National Geographic and Atmospheric Administration. And it indicates the last five years are the hottest five years in the history of the planet, the recorded history of the planet. And that it's been going up since we began using carbon-based fuel in the mid 1990s. It's been going up radically. Uh, there's no coincidence there. Next, please. Now, the, this research says, uh, uh, where's the CO2 coming from? Where's the, where are the gases, CO, the greenhouse gases coming from? It's done by, uh, for California, it's done by uh, Scripps, Lawrence Livermore Lab, UC Berkeley research scientists, uh, several re, uh, Nobel laureates involved. And uh, it indicates that 38, almost 40% is coming from transportation, cars. Uh, trucks, planes, trains that, that burn uh, petroleum fuel. Uh, industry we can't reach, that government has to reach them and they're not doing a very consistent job there, but they're trying, at least trying harder now. And then electric generation and electric imports are another 23%. Well, that compare, coupled with the 38% puts you at about 60% of the carbon coming from transportation and electric generation. So uh, the rest of it is important. We want to fight the agriculture. We want to eat, eat close to uh, your home. Uh, uh, want our residents uh, to be uh, better insulated uh, and all the rest. But the, the ones we really have to work on, if we're going to get there, is transportation and electric energy uh, generation and use. Um, that 60% we have control of, you and I, and we, if we do the right job, that will give us enough time so that our very smart kids will be able to have some time left in the, this horizon to fix it. So that's our task. Next, please. The uh, solutions. Uh, this research was done by a really smart guy. Uh, a professor from the, um, whose name skips my mind. It's actually printed down in there, but it doesn't come out of the black very well. Uh, and he, uh, he was the chair of the National Research Council Transportation Committee. And the research showed that the primary source of the CO2 gases was cars. Airplanes, especially short hop airlines are as bad as cars. Uh, buses, diesel buses are terrible and trucks. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our local transit agency is converting to uh, hybrid and electric buses in total. So we're, we have a, a horizon there. And the, the electric uh, trucks are, are taking over from uh, diesel trucks because they're cheaper uh, and life, life cycle cheaper. But the real solutions we have right here in our valley, light rail, uh, BART, commuter rail, uh, converted over to electricity, which uh, Caltrain, by the way, is almost there now. And then high-speed rail that's coming into the valley uh, in the next 10 years. That's, that's the solution. And that's what the rest of the world is doing. That's what we have to catch up with. Next, please. Uh, so what's happening? I've already mentioned it to you. Food production is being disrupted uh, throughout the equatorial area around the globe. And the result of that is that we're having mass migrations. People are starving. They can't feed their families anymore. So they're, they're coming in droves across the Mediterranean, dying in, in, in little inflatable rafts in order to get to Europe, not because they love Europe, but because Europe has the water. And as they move further north, uh, they con will continue to follow the water. Uh, and uh, uh, the same thing's happening here in the United States, but all these poor folks piled up against the fence in the southern part of the United States. And all they, all they want is a place to farm and, and be able to take care of their families. And, uh, and we're gonna have to figure out how to handle that. Uh, we're having unexpected epidemics. I'm not gonna go into detail there. Uh, dingo fever and, and all those kinds of things are being brought into this area 
as the heat uh, drives the, the uh, germs out of the central part of the globe and into the area in the globe that still has water. Water shortages, we don't have to talk about that. We've been in a drought and the drought is only gonna be much, much more serious in the future. We're having a little respite right now, but uh, it's gonna be much, much more serious in the future. And it's already, uh, it's already caused uh, North Africa to be uninhabitable. Uh, uh, radically inclement weather, well, for, we, we know that. Forest fires, flooding, droughts, uh, you folks, uh, you folks are going to have uh, bayfront property if uh, if we don't handle this because the ocean is supposed to go up between 100 and 200 feet. And that's going to flood all of downtown San Jose, and of course the polar ice caps are melting, and that's causing the flooding. Uh, if if the polar ice caps melt, ice caps melt, as I just mentioned, and the Greenland ice cap melts, and they're melting very rapidly right now the oceans will go up 100 to 200 feet. That's, uh, that means we all better learn to swim. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just that's frightening situation. Next, please. This uh, is from Time Magazine. It's the quote from Secretary General Guterres, and it, it declares to you, for you to see here uh, that we had 12 years left in 2018 before the many of the uh, long, many of the effects of, of climate change would become long term and permanent. That's a pretty dire quote, and I tell you, I'm listening to it as, as a grandpa with two with four wonderful grandbabies. I want them to have a, a good life. Next, please. This what that what that article said is what this green this uh, graph shows you. The green line is what will happen if we get on it now, take the radical action necessary and have that action in place by 2030. Well, then we'll be on the green line. It's, it's still uncomfortable, but it's gonna be livable. If we don't, then we're on the red line and that red line is to oblivion. Next, please. Uh, my old friend, Hal Harvey, that's a scientist up at uh, Berkeley, uh, pardon me, at Stanford, uh, has the directions for us. Next, please. Hal says that uh, the solution is to transfer all power uh, to the grid, to the electrical grid, so that everything is electrified. We have no more use for petroleum products or any carbon-based energy. Coal, petroleum, uh, and wood, uh, should never be used again. Uh, and we have to do that as quickly as we can. Now, quickly as we can is probably going to be 10, 20 years, but we need to try to do it as quick as possible to give as much time as possible for the next generation to be able to figure out a way out of this terrible, terrible condition. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the message from Dr. Harvey, and it's been quoted many, many, many times. Next, please. Um, the solutions, I, I just mentioned them to them. I'll skip down through quickly. High-speed metro, light rail, uh, electric and hybrid buses and cars. Uh, bicycles are really good for your heart. And of course, walking. Next, please. And sustainable buildings, uh, home and backyard solar. I mentioned our 34 solar panels. Uh, battery walls for your, for your, to store that energy. Uh, so that you're uh, independent from the grid. Then when PG&E cuts off your power for a period of time, you thumb your nose at them and use the power stored in your grid that didn't cost you a dime because you were able to do it uh, from the solar panels, which pay for themselves in a very short period of time. And uh, uh, sustainably generate electricity, solar panels. Home installation, if you have an opportunity to insulate your home, you should do that. And it, requires a whole lot less energy and uh, eliminate uh, any carbon-based uh, combustion. Next, please. These are the, uh, uh, these, this is what we are asking you to do. And we hope that and when I leave this meeting, you create a, a climate action committee for your Rotary Club. 
I'll come back and help anytime. The uh, San Jose Rotary Club, which by the way, has 40 members of their Rotary Climate Action Committee now. And by the, by the way, it's attracted a lot of younger Rotarians. Two of those were attracted to join the San Jose Rotary Club to be members of the Rotary Climate Action Committee. They then went on to run for the city council and were elected. They're, they're currently elected council members, Matt Mahan and, and David Cohen. Uh, so it's a great way of bringing in young members to your Rotary Club to have a Rotary Climate Action Committee. Uh, so uh, that, that source of dynamic young leadership and yourselves it needs to be out there talking to your women school clubs, your, your uh, uh, chambers of commerce, your neighborhood associations and so on to tell them how serious the situation is so that they can begin encouraging their members uh, to uh, shift to, to solar, solar bat battery walls, and to acquire uh, electric cars. By the way, an electric car will pay for itself in a 12-year life cycle, completely pay for itself in a 12-year life cycle. Um, so uh, if you can't do those things, then all we can do is pray for our children. And by God, I'm going to do more than pray. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> Uh, this is what's happening in our valley now, and I'll, we'll, we'll click through this, and you'll see what's happening. There's the there's the uh, electrified uh, uh, commuter rail system. That's the BART uh, system originally. Next, that's the BART extension, which is under construction now. It's already down past the, the county boundary line and in operation to Berryessa. The last part is going into construction soon. Very expensive because it's been delayed so long, but uh, it's, it's gonna be, it's, it's necessary. Next, please. There's the light rail system as originally. Next, please. Those are the extensions that have occurred already. They're in operation. Next, please. Those are the extensions that are agreed upon and are under study now to be done. Next, please. Buses, I, I don't show the buses, but the buses are being converted to electric and hybrid and they cover the valley and are being pulled back uh, so that when the rail systems, the electric rail systems uh, uh, take over an area, the buses are pulled back to become a neighborhood feeder system into the local rail uh, stations. We have 65 rail stations in our valley now, by the way. So we're beginning to look like a European community instead of like a backward US transportation system. Next, please. Uh, High-speed rail, this is what's planned uh, to be in operation 30, by 2030. The route from San Francisco through San Jose to Gilroy, under the Pacheco Pass and tunnels and to Fresno and the Central Valley line, which is, by the way, almost completed, uh, is supposed to be in operation by 2030. Uh, next, please. And then there's the multimodal station at the Deardon station downtown. Uh, next, please. And there's the, the station at the Mineta Institute, at Mineta Airport. Uh, by, by the way, uh, Norm is a dear friend, and, and we argue about whether it's better to have a train station or an airport named after you. Uh, we'll never agree on that argument, by the way. We have conflicts of interest. Um, but they're working on uh, developing a, a connector now. It's called an automated guideway transit system and a horizontal elevator following the freeways uh, between the, uh, the station and the airport so that the high-speed train system, people can feed directly into the airport without having to go through all the security again. Next, please. Uh, those are the resources. This, let's see, references. If you want to check anything that you've uh, heard there they, there's the emails to check with right now. Uh, you can do it whenever you'd like to. If you want to uh, follow up on getting a, a solar system for your home, uh, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District will tell you how to get your, your about 30% when you put it all together, uh, state, uh, federal, state, and uh, local incentives are reduce the cost about 30%. And by the way, they pay for the whole cost of your roof if you have to have the roof done at the same time as you're putting in the solar panels. And the Metropolitan Transportation Commission will 
to give you an idea of how to take care of the uh, your transportation requirements, so mass transportation and uh, so on. So those are resources for you. Let's go back one click, please. Okay, let's leave that up and and let me be, let me end my comment and hopeful hopefully uh, we'll have some time for questions. But um, I'll, and I'll have a closing statement at the very end. But let's let's uh, note that uh, your valley is ahead of most places in the United States by having master plans a completely sustainable transportation system where the the uh, something like 80 percent of the of the residents will be within uh, a mile of a train station or uh, uh, have access to the train station through a bus feeder line so it's it's going to be sustainable in the future it's getting that way now we have the master plan the funding is being acquired this latest infrastructure bill passed at the federal level certainly is helping us and uh, so we're doing it the right way. We just have to buy some time by reducing our, our reliance on fossil fuel uh, in the interim. Uh, let, me, let me pause now and tell you that I have great hope. I think we're gonna make this happen okay for our kids. And uh, let, me, let me answer your questions as I hope you're thinking about creating your climate action committee in your Rotary Club. All right. Um, Brian? Questions now, Brian? Yeah. Brian, you were going to be moderator here? Sure. I get a question, Brian. Okay. Uh, Dave Olson has a question in the gallery. Hi, David. Hi. How are you doing, Rod? Rod, can you hear me, Rod? I can. Yes. Thank you. Good. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious as to we seem to have, there seems to be a lot of politics involved, especially the transportation area. Uh, you know, it really is pretty obvious that we're behind in transportation because we have countries like Europe that have had high speed rail for, for years. And why are we so behind when we're su such an advanced country in itself? And it's you now costing us billions of more dollars because we've elected things like putting BART around the whole loop of the Bay Area in the 1960s, and now we're trying to make up for it by doing electrified Caltrain for billions of dollars. Can you speak to that? Well, I sure can. It's a favorite uh, favorite antagoni uh, agony for me because I, I watched that happen. Uh, I was elected to office originally in, in the early 70s, and uh, we began studying these transportation programs at that time. And at that time, we had enough money identified to build our transportation systems in Santa Clara County. And we were pushing BART to get their system done. Unfortunately, uh, it was delayed and, and the petroleum industry, which is the real problem, has a huge public relations effort going continuously. Uh, something calculated or something in the neighborhood of $11 billion was spent on petroleum product advertisements and direct advocacy back in Washington at state levels uh, from the petroleum industries, all the way from, from uh, oil drilling and fracking right on up to refining and uh, transport and use. And we just couldn't fight against that. And it's so subtly done and so skillfully done that it, they don't even look like they have fingerprints on it. But the upshot was that they, the, by 1990, the gas, taps, the gas tax, which was the funding device for transportation systems, was no longer able to be increased because there was so much opposition to a gas tax. And that opposition was encouraged by petroleum country, companies. So all of a sudden, instead of being able to fund transportation improvements through the gas tax, we couldn't do it anymore. The result was that we had to go to a sales tax and a sales tax is very hard to be, have adopted. In California, it requires a two thirds vote. Now in Santa Clara County, the reason why we have a good system master plan and under construction is because we've had five, thanks to the Silicon Valley Leadership Group and Carl Guardino, We've had five different sales taxes, uh, although I, I chaired the first one. Uh, we had five different sales taxes approved 
and have used that to build the BART extension to Santa Clara County and the light rail system and the upgrades to Caltrain and, and those kinds of things. We still need more funding, uh, but some of that is on the way. But I, I feel good about what we're doing in Santa Clara County. I worry about the rest of the, of the United States though, because there's so much opposition to any taxation. And uh, there's, there, there's they, some, especially in the middle part of the country, there's denying that there is even climate change. So it's, it's very, it shouldn't be political. It is a life and death situation and it didn't used to be political back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, but it's become very political now. And all we can do is fight as hard as we can to get it done. And that's what I'm doing. And that's what I hope you'll, you'll do. Thank you. Let me, let me mention one more thing, David, because you brought up a good point. When I was growing up, it was never right to say that America is second in anything. We were always number one. Well, we are not number one in anything anymore, except pollution. We are by far the worst polluting country in the world in terms of pollution per capita. Almost three times as bad as, as China, which is the next worst and per, uh, per capita. And, and uh, China is trying hard to fix it. China has began 30 years ago and they now have 25,000 miles of high-speed rail, 235 mile an hour high-speed rail built in an operation in China. And they're converting all of their other uh, rail systems into electrically powered rail systems. So they're gonna have over 120,000 miles of rail uh, providing service in China, all of it electrically powered. They're, they're converting their, their coal-fired plants to tertiary treated coal fire plants that are going to be much cleaner. And then they're gradually going to be eliminating those uh, as, uh, as their solar and wind and nuclear uh, take the place. So China is doing a great job compared to us. And it's one of the reasons why we're having a hard time convincing the rest of the world to be concerned about climate change. Next so, uh, so Rob, this is a this hi, this is Joan Perry, by the way. Hi, How are you? Have Good seen you for many years. Uh -huh. so, I remember you. Uh, yeah, thank you. So this is a really crazy question. So pardon me for asking it, but you know, we're also tainted by all that money that was spent for the, you know, mass transit that, you know, was going to go all the way up and down the state. Is there any possibility that those funds get diverted to some kind of climate change or, you know, uh, quite honestly, we're all horrified at the amount of money that, you know, was spent by that project and it's not completed. Um, I don't understand enough the funding mechanisms to know, but such a dire situation as you're talking about, you know, there, there was massive use of funds there and more coming. Joan, that, the, that project was a high-speed rail project that was supposed to go from Sacramento to LA to San Diego and from, uh, uh, from the Central Valley to our Silicon Valley in San Francisco. Right. When they originally did the research on that, uh, it was supposed to be about $44 billion. In, and that's when they finally did the good research just before the election in 2008. But then they didn't begin the project. The project was held up because we have very strong environmental laws. We couldn't get the environmental impact reports done. And because we didn't have all the money uh, from the bond measure anymore. The bond measure was $10 billion and the, uh, the project was already at $44 billion. Right. And the federal government was no longer funding those kinds of projects because their gas tax revenue had gone down. Right. So um, let me, you all know how to calculate compound interest. And what happened is that that $44 billion in 2008, when nothing was done and it wasn't built, it compounded because construction inflation goes up at between five and 10% per year. And so when $44 billion is compounded five to 10% per year, it doubles in 10 to 12 years. That's right. And so now here we are, it was passed in 2008, 
we're we're a decade and a half later, and that forty four billion dollars is now uh, at nearing a hundred billion dollars. It's actually over eighty billion dollars, and and um, that wasn't that wasn't anybody's bad management. That was purely and simply the cost of inflation on construction, and and without having uh, the federal government helping us. Uh, as the, they had promised to, uh, we're still not able to build the whole thing at once. So let me give you the time timing on what's gonna happen now. The Central Valley portion of that line from Merced to Bakersfield will be in operation uh, by 2027 or 28. Uh, the, the portion between Fresno and Bakersfield will be in operation by 2026. Uh, that's all cleared, it's all under construction and uh, they're spending somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 billion for it. That's a rough estimate. The, the link to Silicon Valley, and by the way, not many people are gonna use that line in Central Valley. I was gonna say, by the way, Rod, I don't need to go from Bakersfield to Fresno. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it isn't gonna serve us very well at all, <laughs> but even, even in the Central Valley, although it's rapidly growing in the Central Valley. Fresno is a million people now, by the right. way, the Fresno metropolitan area. Bakersfield is over 500,000, so it's rapidly growing, but it, it uh, isn't gonna be profitable immediately. Like light rail systems around the world are profitable. The only transportation systems that are profitable. But the link from just north of Fresno at a place called Chowchilla, uh, through uh, the uh, Pacheco Pass, in uh, four tunnels. One of those tunnels is 15 miles long. So it's environmentally sensitive. And it comes out at Gilroy and then it joins the Caltrain system and we'll use the electrified Caltrain system. That link will cost another uh, $14 billion all, all the way up to San Francisco. And that part of that is gonna be funded by the infrastructure bill that was just adopted by, by Congress and uh, and hopefully it will all be done for us. Those, those numbers, by the way, are inflated to construction here, um, showing the, the costs of, of the money, uh, the, the compounding interest costs. So we need that link though. Let me describe uh, the biggest problem we have by actual poll uh, in our valley right now is housing. We, we don't have enough housing and as a result, the housing costs have gone crazy and we have a hard time recruiting the best and the brightest from around the world to come to work in our, our companies because they can't find jobs here. So we send them over to have a find a, pardon me, they, they, they can't find housing here. So we send them over to live in Fresno or Merced or, or in, in a North Central Valley. And right now over 200,000 of them each morning is taking the trip into Silicon Valley by car and 200,000 are leaving the Silicon Valley and going home by car. That trip is taking two and a half to three and a half hours per direction. Now those poor kids are leaving their home before their babies wake up. They're working a full day. They drive over those terrible roads, burning four and a half dollar a gallon gasoline. They get to work frazzled. Uh, the, uh, they work a full day and, and maybe more. They then turn around and drive home over those terrible roads, arrive after the kids are asleep. That's a terrible lifestyle. Now, when that train goes in, it's gonna be 51 minutes, rain or shine, from Fresno to the Duradon station, 51 minutes. And at the Duradon station, you'll have the distribution system that you saw being developed there, available to take the people uh, to their employment locations. And that's what we need in the future. That's what Europe has now. We don't have it because the, the petroleum companies have killed them, killed this kind of a program in the past. Now we're the lead in the, in the nation. We're the, we're the lead high-speed rail project in the nation, which will stimulate all of the electrically powered feeder and distribution systems. And it's our job now to prove that it can be done so the rest of the nation shifts over to electrically powered transportation too. And that's, that's my comment.
Yeah, I rode the train in from Philadelphia, from the suburbs of Philadelphia every day into the city, you know, and you know, we have to have that kind of thing, I agree. But well, I just, it caused a discontent amongst the populace of how much that project costs. And so it's easy to sit back and go, okay, environmental, you know, that seems to be the highest priority, but everything costs so much. Don't let me tell you why you've been saturated with criticism on the cost of the high-speed rail project. <coughs> the petroleum companies have created a half a dozen different um, organizations up and down those tracks, neighborhood organizations, theoretically, and uh, at the state level, putting out a uh, so-called research, criticizing the project. Well, anybody who knows construction realizes the project is doing what the project has to do and and uh, but the the news continues to be negative because of the media being promoted by the petroleum industry uh, that must be very frustrating for you oh it is terribly frustrating and because we need it so badly and we need to have it done so quickly and we have we have much time <laughs> Question, another question? No, no, it's 1.30, one it's 1.30, and we need to go. It's a quick question, it's fine. But, okay, but uh, Rob, I'll, I'll is, stay as long as you like me to be, uh, Brian. 30 second answer, please. <laughs> okay, 30 seconds. So is the petroleum industry, are they polluting uh, the, the Biden administration because they didn't invite them to the electric vehicle summit? Because uh, they're the largest producer of electric vehicles in the United States. It seems like, it's politicized, but in many different ways. And I don't think it's just the, I don't think it's just petroleum because I mean, there's petroleum also pushing down the use of nuclear energy. It, it seems like there's okay. a lot of different balls seconds. in here. Thank you. Okay. The, the, answer, the answer to your rhetorical question is, is <laughs> yes. Obviously there are others that are being critical too, Chris. And, and uh, um, it isn't just the petroleum industry. But the petroleum industry is the biggest, they're the 900 pound gorilla in the room. And uh, they're the ones that are funding campaigns in opposition to anybody who wants to shift over to electric energy. So um, I guess, I guess uh, it isn't just petroleum industry, the carbon, the carbon industry generally. For example, the reason why Senator Manchin isn't voting for the sustainability programs is because he supports coal. His, his state is a coal uh, manufacturing state, uh, a mining state, and he wants to support coal. Well, coal is a terrible polluter uh, in terms of carbon. And so uh, it isn't just petroleum, coal industry and, and some of the uh, associated industries certainly are also culpable. Okay. Okay. And um, Wendy, did you want to ask a question? Yes. Uh, so, uh, Rod, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thanks, um, Wendy. Multifold here. Um, I would love uh, Brian or whoever has. You're frozen. Has the slide. If you could send us the resources, that would be great. I didn't get a chance to snap a picture of it. Am I still okay. am I here now? Yeah. Bad internet yeah, all yeah. day, and I get yeah, bad internet. So uh, my question would be, if we have additional questions for you since this meeting is coming to an end, how could we reach you to ask uh, additional questions? Because I do have a question, but it's much longer than time will allow today. Okay, let me let me give you a, a quick three-part answer. The, the first is that you can have the PowerPoint that I just used. Brian has it in his machine there. <clears throat> You, and you can change the front of the first page, the introductory page, all of the information are in blocks. So you can just change those blocks any way you want. Put your own credits, put your own name in. Uh, it probably would be appropriate to continue to reference the source of the data, but uh, you, whatever you wanna do on the front page is, is up to you and the rest of it, don't change it because it's factual, uh, but you can use it any way you want to uh, as individual resource items or as, as, as the support for a presentation at your home and school club. Uh, the, the second point uh, is that uh, if you create a climate action committee within your club, uh, they could make you the chair of that or the liaison, and you can become a member of the District 5170 
Rotary Climate Action Council. And all you need to do is to send me your email saying that you want to do that. And I'll put you on the council distribution list and you'll be getting council invitations. We have a meeting coming up in two weeks. And uh, my email, by the way, for everybody, it's on the, it's on the document, by the way, but it's RJ Diridon, one word, RJ D-I-R-I-D-O-N at gmail.com. Okay, great. And I have it too, Wendy, so I can uh, I'll forward everything to you. Thanks, Brian. Okay, Thanks. well, thank, thank you, you very much. Let's all give it a thank you. Thank you. Hey, may I end up, may I leave you a, a, a comment, Brian? Uh, please. Uh, I'm 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 not looking forward to 10 years from now when we know what the answer is. But if the answer isn't the answer we want in terms of our solutions, those four grandbabies are going to be young adults and they're going to look me in the eye and they're going to say, Grandpa, did you do all you could possibly do to protect us when you had the chance to stop climate change? I'm going to look them back with tears in my eye and say, yes, I did. What will you say? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Okay, on that. We'll see you next week.